Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we pray, Lord, it would penetrate our hearts this morning. We pray your spirit would open us up to all that you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. On Friday, I, I read an email that was being circulated around the internet and, uh, and from several people in our church. It was quoting Franklin Graham and speaking of First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. And he began with, the American dream has ended. And he went on to lament the reasons for the Norman Rockwell's America that's ended. And in the email, um, he closed with, those who come after us will once again have to risk their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to bring back the republic that, is gener that this generation has timidly frittered away due to their guilt and political correctness. It's a very sobering talk that Graham gave, but two things need to be known about this. First of all, it was given January 30th, 2015. And he didn't stop there where the email did. I looked up the event, it was a pastor's conference, and, and the things he said are frankly more true today than they, than they were even back then. But it's helpful to know that he was preaching from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, where Jesus is asleep in a boat during a very powerful storm, and the, the disciples are panicking, they think they're going to die, and they wake him up. And he merely says, peace be still. And the storm stopped. And Graham used this scripture to compare Jesus and his disciples in a boat when the storm came up and the need of the United States of America's Christians to have their hope in one thing and one thing only, and that is Jesus Christ. Listen to his summation. Jesus told them, don't you guys realize the boat can't sink? I'm in this boat. And if you're in this boat with me, you're not going to sink. America has changed and it's not coming back unless the church takes a stand. There are storms that are coming, storms of God's judgment. I'm here to tell you the only hope. If this country repents of its sins and turns again, to, once again, to the God of their fathers and to his son, Jesus Christ. You know, I read the email. I knew it wasn't the entire story. It couldn't be. You, you, you see that a lot, right? However, it was a stark reminder that our times are indeed perilous. But hope is never lost because Jesus rules and reigns in righteousness. First Chronicles 29, 11 assures us, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head above all. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> past few months, our focus has been on what it means to follow in the way of Christ. We've focused on the truth that everything that the Father made available to the Son is available to us. Everything that Jesus needed to accomplish the will of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit, the help of uh, the, all the Father could give to him, as a human being, he needed those things, but they're available to us as well if we will follow him as Savior and Lord. We walk in the authority of the name of Jesus and in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Last time we considered Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, and quoting myself here, I said, Paul's prayer is that the Ephesian church might actually experience the fullness of God, not merely the fullness of his grace, but of all that he is in himself. As overwhelming as this may sound, Paul seems to be praying that we and other Christians around us may be filled to up to all the fullness that is in God himself, not merely in the future, but beginning in the here and now. He knows the impossibility. We can never fully experience all there is of God's fullness. But what if we tried? What would it be like if all those who testify to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ would earnestly seek to encounter God in their prayers, in their study of God's Word, and in their worship? What if Christians pursued God more earnestly than anything else in their lives? 
How would that impact the world around them? How would that change our country? I think Paul is praying that Christians would long for that, unquote. I hope that's been something you've thought about the past few weeks. What if we pursued Jesus just like that? What if we invited him to, to do whatever he needed to do that we might be the servants that he's called us to be? And so today I want to return to considering the impact on our world if those who have truly surrendered their lives to the glory of God live as, as if it was more important than anything else in our lives. Let me share what I long for in my relationship with Christ. Every part of my life as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a pastor, as a neighbor, as a citizen, as a brother or friend is affected by who I am in Jesus Christ. If I find areas in my life that are not submitted to the Lord, it needs to change. I can't say, well, that's just who I am. It's a lie. It's not who I can be in Christ. And this should affect how I appear to those I come in contact with at the grocery store, the bank, restaurants, or any place where I am. It's imperative that I remember that Jesus goes with me. And that changes a lot of things, doesn't it? Our primary passage this morning is from our gospel reading from John chapter 6, 53 to 59. But first I want to begin by considering the passage we read in Proverbs 9, 1 to 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her, be her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here to him who lacks sense. She says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live. Walk in the ways of insight. Proverb 9 shows a, a contrast between wisdom and folly. In our passage, wisdom is depicted as, as a, a gracious and, and noble patroness who invites the young and the gullible to come to a feast and receive life. Her invitation is seen in contrast to verses 13 to 18 where folly coaxes the gullible, enticed by erotic lust, and there they find the path to death. Listen to Folly's coaxing verses. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. And bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. You'll notice that both invite guests who are to a gullible guest to the feast. But wisdom's invitation is from love and a desire for the well-being, whereas folly seeks to deceive and destroy. Wisdom's house is, is well-built. You notice it has seven pillars, suggesting it's very large and there's room for anyone and everyone who wants to come. And she has sacrificed an animal. She's broken bread. She prepares her wine, usually with honey and herbs to make it more spicy. We'll read about that in, in Song of Solomon 8, too. Wisdom has prepared a feast that will satisfy every need. It was a reminder to Israel of how God had prepared a table for them in the wilderness. He had given them manna the bread of angels to feed them, and living water from a rock to quench their thirst. They had been in a situation where only God could satisfy their need, and without him they would simply die. This proverb was a reminder to Israel of God's faithfulness and provision for them, and that wisdom called them to turn away from their folly and return to covenant faithfulness with God. The God who had loved them. And we, we can see in this passage anticipated this banquet of divine wisdom that the Holy Spirit invites his guests to come to, which would be, would be furnished with the costliest of provisions that God had to give. In our gospel passage this morning, 
Jesus declares himself to be that feast. That meat and that drink that God was providing through the sacrifice of his son. The Lamb of God. Proverbs 9, 5 to 6 exhorts those who are simple. Come, leave your simple ways, live and walk in the way of insight. And we, we see some of the same invitation from Jesus to those who would come to see the way of life, the way of wisdom. So let's turn now to John 6, 53 to 59. But I want to go back to verse 51 to get the full context of what Jesus was saying and the reason from, for such a strong reaction from the crowd. John 6, 51 to 55. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so Jesus said to them, Truly, I truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Now, in all fairness, I have looked at this passage from every translation I could. It's still a tough word to hear. The Jews had come to him as a rabbi, and they're considering that maybe perhaps this man was the, could be the messianic king that they had longed for, that they'd been waiting for for so long. They had seen and experienced his power through, through healings and the feeding of 5,000 men plus women and children with just five barley loaves and two fish. They had marveled at the, his teaching with authority. But they were still skeptical as to who he really was. It's kind of like Nicodemus in John chapter 3 coming and Jesus saying, you must be born again. And he says, how could this be? But Jesus doesn't take, take it easy on them. He does not make it easy for them at all. Because he wants them to understand that real eating and drinking are involved here. He furthers the offense by stating that without eating his flesh and drinking his blood, they would not have life. He's letting them know that what he is offering them is not something that's optional and could be ignored. He was telling them that his flesh and blood were what food and drink should be. That they fulfilled the perfect function of food and drink. They sustain and give life. And Jesus was referring, what he was referring to would not be fully understood until after his death, resurrection, and his ascension, and the sending back of the Holy Spirit. But his death was the ultimate laying down of life. His resurrection, his ascension, and sending back the Holy Spirit brought on the human scene this new possibility of actually sharing in, the, in life with God. And Jesus reveals this in his high priestly prayer, John 17, verses 20 to 21. So I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through the word. That's us. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I mean, the ultimate source of life is the Father, as Jesus explains in, in verse 57. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. We see here Jesus is inviting us into the life that he shares with the Father. Our lives are completely dependent on partaking of Jesus in the same way that his life and the flesh was totally dependent on the Father. He's inviting those who come to him by faith to participate in the shared life that his death would make possible. And using the language of eating and drinking, he chooses a very graphic way of, of what must happen. We must take him into our innermost being 
as we become one with Jesus and with the Father. We come to Jesus by faith and repentance of sin. There's an immediate change of status, but there's also a spiritual inward reality as the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. When this happens, change is unavoidable. You know that, right? There's no room in this teaching for what is known as the carnal Christian doctrine, which teaches that as long as you prayed the prayer and asked Jesus to forgive you for your sins, you could do whatever you want after that. The Bible doesn't teach that. Our culture is bathed in it, but it's bathed in a lie. In this metamorphosis, Jesus is teaching that those who feed on him will live forever as he lives forever. But they'll also become more and more like him. And this is why he says in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There would be no participation in the life with God without also participating in the self-surrender of Jesus. There's some controversy as to whether or not Jesus is speaking about the Lord's table, the Eucharist. Some, some mistakenly think that this text teaches that receiving the bread and the cup of the Lord's table is essential for salvation, and that all who, who do that are guaranteed salvation. Actually, if you look at the Word of God, very little is actually required to receive salvation. The thief on the cross kind of points us to that. Jesus said if we come to him in repentance and believe that he is the Son of God, we shall be saved. But what does that believing mean? It means things change. It means because we believe that, we no longer believe what we did. It's not about us anymore. It's about him and his glory. I mean, all that thief had was faith with Jesus as king and his desire to be with him. I believe they are missing the essential point that Jesus is inviting us to come by faith, embracing the purpose of his perfect sacrifice of body and blood. And the physical act of eating the bread and drinking from the cup at the Eucharist must be done by faith, and that's why Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And it was on the night of his betrayal. He was inviting them to see his sacrifice as the perfect solution to their separation from God due to their sin. But he's also instructing them to feed on the body and the blood through the elements of, of bread and wine. Both of these acts come through faith and would be the only way to receive life. Faith, faith is the key both in repentance and partaking of the elements in the Eucharist. At the table, we have this point of, of contact with divine reality. It's a means of grace that's imparted to the believer by faith. There's no magic in the elements, and the Apostle Paul even warns in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 30, that those who come to the table without faith are actually in danger of God's judgment. The body and the blood of Jesus are life-giving to those who partake in faith, but not to those who don't. And the focus on his teaching here is a personal sacrifice and a shared life. He was showing that these two things are inseparable, and there will be no sharing in his life without the laying down of life. The once and for all sacrifice of Christ is the pouring out of his life for the life of the world, bringing forgiveness and a new power of life. That sacrifice also points us to this deepest reality about God and about his love and about life, that all true life is sacrificial. Life is a, a matter of exchange of my life for yours and yours for mine. And this sacrifice, this view of sacrifice, there's an exchange here. That's where we find communion there. 
We find a communion with our, with our brethren in the church, but within the community, we model what it means to sacrifice our lives. Sadie was pointing us to something important this morning, a way to lay your life down for someone else, to reveal what Christ has done with you. At the Eucharist, we receive life into ourselves, into our bodies and our souls, the life-giving power of God. And precisely by eating the bread and drinking the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The insistence on the, uh, on the Eucharist, this physical activity for eternal life, is theologically and spiritually very important. It protects us from an overly cerebral or false spiritual form of Christianity. And salvation itself is something that encompasses all of life. It affects every bit of our life. There's not one part of our lives that we keep it apart from our, our relationship with God. It's not a matter of having right opinions or even right actions. It's much larger than that for us. Since all of creation is involved in one day, we're going to be restored. Everything we see will be restored one day by Christ. And John teaches us not to simply embrace the spiritual, that Jesus wants us to restore the physical as well. Jesus, God in the flesh, in his very incarnation, he has shown in his physical life that it was spiritual because he's sharing in the divine life. He's actually doing, physically doing what the Father sent him to do. Why? So he benefited? No, so that we benefited. So the Father was glorified. And this means, this is what life is and what Jesus, we talked about in Sunday school this morning. Jesus washing the feet of, of his disciples. And that very act was something that even Peter didn't want him to do that because he wasn't worthy of it. But Jesus said, that's not the point. I'm modeling for you what it looks like for God to serve you. And this is why you serve others. Our bodies themselves are to be transformed into vessels of service in God's kingdom. So the imagery involved in eating and drinking or in notions of laying down life and internal renewal is present in this passage and in the Eucharist itself. But our present life with the, with the Trinity is more than just imagery because within our union with Christ, eternity is also present. The divine and the human realms meet in the flesh of Jesus, and that's what the sacrament is, a material point of contact between physical and spiritual reality. Jesus' own body is the convergence of, of these realms, and he, point, he provides points of contact for the nourishment of the body, the church. This passage is referring to Christ's death and our life in him, as is the Eucharist. And so it's fitting that the Eucharist is alluded to here, though the primary refer reference is to Jesus' death and the life he offers us. As I pointed out earlier, for the past few months, we've considered the walk of Jesus on this earth as our model. We define what the gospel message should be as opposed to what it has become in our culture. We considered the power of the resurrection and how it encouraged us that this is God's world and therefore nothing is impossible. We were reminded that Jesus ascended back to the Father as reigning king of creation because Jesus won, Satan lost. This should give us some amazing encouragement and hope no matter what the newspaper is trying to tell us. We know the story. We know the backstory. We know what really happened. And we know the hope that we find in that. Of course, for every series of hope, there, that will not only change, but everything around us or how we feel, but it will change the way we live. 
that it becomes the pattern of life for us because it brings us joy and peace that's not found in anything but a deeper walk with Christ. There's nothing you can buy that will ultimately satisfy the craving of your heart. I remember a friend of mine, he had dreamed, saved his money, a certain car he wanted. He wanted that car. And he was doing everything in his life to save the money to buy that car. He got the money. He bought the car. I said, no, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. It wasn't the car. A fuller understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done for us should bring about this change. But if it doesn't, it's like handing somebody a brand new 10 million watt flashlight and no batteries. <laughs> it looks new, it looks good, but it doesn't seem to provide any light. It's useless for the purpose for which it was intended. And today's passage from John chapter 6, Jesus is still teaching us that we must be transformed from within. And when that happens, his priorities become ours because his heart becomes ours too. I'm constantly reminded that I cannot do the things that God commands me to do in my own strength. I just don't have it. I often don't have the, the energy or the knowledge, and sometimes I don't have the desire. Has that ever happened to you? I just want to leave well enough alone. It's easy to feel guilty about not doing this or that, but that's not what Jesus was offering us this morning. He's offering us life in him. Now, because he indwells us through the power of his Holy Spirit, as Philippians 4, 13 says, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I want more than anything else for God to raise us up to levels and places that are totally impossible in our own strength. It can happen if we will pursue by faith, inviting him in to transform us into his likeness through his flesh and blood, because that's our true food and drink. We should feed upon the Lord through his word and through praise and worship. We must daily seek him, his presence, and the nourishment received through word and spirit. And I often think about the this discouraging and depressing news that we are daily bombarded with by the media. Our enemy wants us to receive a, a steady diet of discouragement because that leads to anger and to frustration, hopelessness, and, and what I used to call shadow boxing. That if I was there, I would fantasizing about how you can get back at that person for doing this. That's not the heart of Christ. But it's, it's what happens when we start listening to all these things and anger becomes a part of our lives and hopelessness becomes a part of our lives. But if we're following Jesus Christ, if we're pursuing him and what's, what his heart is for us, that makes us dangerous to the kingdom of darkness as we shine the light of Christ all around us. That should be the outcome of pursuing a deeper walk with Christ. And that must be our daily pursuit of Christ through the feeding, of the feeding on his word and bowing before him in prayer and praise. The world needs the people of God, the church, to stand up proclaiming the lordship of Christ and exposing the deeds of darkness that are celebrated by so many today. It's imperative we do so. Or we have no right to complain when all is lost. We seek nourishment from the body and the blood of Jesus. We must not hesitate to invite Jesus through the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants to do in us. I want to conclude with this morning's epistle reading, which is Paul's exhortation to the church in Ephesus. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. 
Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your word could burn in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would move in power in and through us, that we would be what you have named us, the light of Christ. Lord, I pray we will be those who do not walk in fear, but we walk in wisdom. We walk looking to you to speak to us. Lord Jesus, even you said, I only do what I hear the Father, I see the Father doing, I only say what I hear the Father saying. Lord, let us be so aware of your word in our hearts that that's true of us as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.